I am glad that I'm here and I am very thankful to him for the introduction. Madam Chair, Faculty of Jala University, my team at the ACC, the leadership of the Law Society, Madam President, the leadership of Jala University, distinguished guests here present, students and pupils, I greet you all. Good morning to you. Good. This is going to be a lively conversation on a topic that I hold so dear. Madam Chair, as you have said, the topic is a mouthful. It was because it is something that we need to address as a country. It was carefully chosen to enable us to use a citadel of academia, the Jala University, to steer a conversation around the issue of the intersection of the fight against corruption and the rule of law, both of which need to be properly delineated if we have to set ourselves on a firm footing to enter and progress in the 21st century by attacking one of the menaces that stands in the way of progress and development. We live in a society with institutions that exist and ensure their legitimacy by providing the basic needs for the people to live a happy life. Nothing harms this objective more than the absence of accountability, which ultimately leads to the moral evils of corruption in the organs of this institution. Those were the words by Reverend Father Augustine Bengali, a, priest, a spirit and priest, as a foreword to the book written by our dear spiritual leader there, Father Luceni, in his book, The Hurricane, The History of Corruption and Accountability in Sierra Leone. Father Luceni, we are very pleased to have you here. <laughs> Mr. Madam Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the rule of law against the fight against corruption is an ongoing battle. The purpose of law in society is to establish standards, maintain order, resolve disputes, and protect liberties and rights so as to keep society peaceful. Law regulates conducts, avoids or settles disputes, sets out rights and obligations, provides remedies, maintains order, provides protections, and sets up the infrastructure of governance so as to direct how we humans relate with ourselves. Thomas Hobbes had pointed out very vividly the life of man without law. He said it would be poor, solitary, nasty, brutish, and short. If you separate man from law, that is what the great philosopher Thomas Hobbes said. And this was encapsulated in the words of H.L.A. Hart in his seminal work, The Concept of Law. It is the existence of laws and sanctions for non-compliance that primarily ensure that people live with each other in an orderly communion. Without law, most likely we'll be fighting ourselves. However, laws are not always enough. And sometimes we focus too much on law. But human society is governed as well by other things apart from law. And that includes culture, traditions, customs, conventions, and usages. If we choose to apply Stone Age laws and thinking to modern wicked problems like corruption, there is a likelihood that they will not be relevant to those issues or they are not robust enough to cover what they are so that we can find solutions. In light of the above, we, ask, so we have to ask ourselves the question, 
How do we expand the territories and boundaries of the law so as to solve what we call in sociology wicked problems? Wicked problems are problems that persist. You do something about them, they continue. They find a way to raise their head again. They are called wicked problems because they don't go away very easily. So do we solve them by applying the same solutions that we have been applying forever and we cannot find solution? If we choose to apply those, we are likely not to succeed. While a lot has been said and done in respect of the rule of law, we have not been able to carefully probe into the role of law. I repeat, while we say a lot about the rule of law, and even our academic teaching is focused on the rule of law, we do very little about the role of law. Focusing on achieving the rule of law in the sense propounded by A.V. Dicey, without defining the role of law in our society, is an elusive venture and may probably remain unachievable. The role of law is to ensure that no sphere of human relation is left unregulated, lest the law will fail to serve its purpose and society likely to degenerate into chaos as each man tries to apply ad hoc rules to fill the void. When there is no law, we apply ad hoc rules. We develop our own solutions. Each society has to find its own, and we do not have a common ground. Without the role of law being defined, the law will fail to provide the answers that society needs. And this is already happening. To change this, we all have to be prepared to shift the parameters of our laws into newer areas and disciplines so as to make them catch up with the changing needs of the times in which we live. From Charlie, as, as ladies we prefer, and I know you to be a feminist, the American Bar Association defines the rule of law as a set of principles or ideals for ensuring an orderly and just society. Where no one is above the law, everyone is treated equally under the law. Everyone is held accountable to the, to the same laws. There are clear and fair processes for enforcing laws. There is an independent judiciary, and human rights are guaranteed for all. In defining whether political leaders and kings should also be subject to the doctrines of the rule of law, Bracton, a British writer and proponent of the doctrine, holds that political power and leaders are a creation of law and must therefore be subject to the law. So basically, that is the rule of law. We are all under the same thing. Whether you are king, you are ruler, or you are just a subject, we all have to apply the same rules to ourselves. So, the rule of law is encapsulated under three headings. It has been summarized under three headings, mainly through the work of A.V. Dicey, which, of course, you people may have come across in government. Not so? You have been told not so? And the one thing is what? Supremacy of the law. That means the law is supreme. Everybody is under it. Equality before the law. That means we are all equal before the law, king or subject. And of course, the last one is that the activities of government must be constructed within the framework of the rule of law. And that framework is basically the two I have said above. Everyone is equal before the law, and the law is above everyone else. Now, that is the foundation of the rule of law, but then... Sierra Leone has a wicked problem, corruption. People who do not wish to change. A system whereby the individual puts his interest above the social interest and they are ready to do everything to undermine the collective growth, growth and progress. Let me 
start by defining what corruption is. The World Bank describes it as a form of dishonesty or criminal offense undertaken by a person or organization entrusted with a position of authority. So first of all, in corruption, there is a power play. There has to be somebody with position of authority or power who then uses it to foster his own interest or the interest of a particular set of people against the collective interest. Transparency International describes it as public servants demanding or taking money or favors in exchange for services, political or otherwise, by misusing public money or granting public jobs or contracts to their sponsors, friends or families, and corporations, or bribing officials to get lucrative deals. Firstly, the foundation. But also, we pretend not to know what really corruption is, but we do. When you do those things that society does not accept, you know within yourself, most times, that you are wrong. So, I have described to you what corruption is. I had also described to you what the rule of law is. Now, there is now the need to synergize them. As a commission and people, more than ever before, we are committed to eradicating corruption. We could agree that we cannot afford to sit to tilt the scale of the rule of law in the fight against corruption in such a way that we undermine the functionality and success of one over the other. We have to strike a balance between the rule of law, which says we need to protect individual liberties and freedoms, and of course, we have to make sure that everybody is equal before the law and treated fairly, but also with fighting a wicked problem called corruption. When you consider the efforts, the effect of corruption, you will understand. This is how Kofi Annan describes it in a foreword to the UN Convention Against Corruption. Corruption is an insidious plague that has a wide range of corrosive effects on societies. It undermines democracies and the rule of law, leads to violation of human rights, distorts markets, erodes the quality of life, and allows organized crime, terrorism, and other threats to human society to flourish. We all say the ground dry, not so. We all say things are hard, not so. But I can assure you the foundation of all those things is really corruption. Where corruption flourishes, the quality of life of humans is reduced. While some benefit more, others suffer. That is why when we are fighting corruption, even though the rule of law is there, we have to be ready to stretch the boundaries of the rule of law to emphasize what I call the collective interest. We prioritize what is good for all of us against what is good for one man. To be ready to make sacrifices where necessary to take action that will protect everybody against the greed of one man or woman. Sometimes this can be a difficult move. Yes, I agree, the human rights activists, that the rule of law must be upheld. I am myself a human rights lawyer. Yes, I agree that the presumption of innocence is cardinal principle of our criminal justice system. But corruption itself is also a human rights issue because when it occurs, for example, public funds or property that are meant for the benefit of the majority of people will be diverted to the use and benefit of an individual or selected few. So let me ask you a question. Is the fight against corruption a human rights issue? Do you agree? Is the fight against corruption a human rights issue? There was a time when people were taken to the cutting tree and everybody was calling for my head. They said that we have violated their human rights and I asked them the question, whose rights are we talking about? The rights of 8 million people 
against the right of three people. That is the debate that we should have. Eight million people have suffered at the hands of the corrupt, the wicked. We gained independence in 1961, and up to now, we are struggling with the basics of life. Water, electricity, food, shelter. And primarily, I can tell you this for sure, is because of corruption. We and Singapore got independence around the same time. But today, Singapore is basically the most, probably the most advanced nation in the world. Why Sierra Leone lies at the bottom of the Human Development Index? Why? It's corruption. So, if we are going to take steps against corruption, which is more important? The suffering 8 million people or the one man who decides to steal everything that is important to those 8 million people? These are conversations we are to have and that is why this lecture is important to all of us. Madam Chair, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the fight against corruption in the context requires strategy and full-blown spectrum to engage everything and everybody within the state power to deal with corruption. We have a system that encourages corruption. We have a system that encourages corruption. The corruption culture in our society is so endemic that we celebrate the corrupt. In churches, they are given front rows so that they can give more money to the pastors. In mosques, they are respected because they have more resources. In politics, they are celebrated because they can spray money around. We all are guilty of one fact. We are only against corruption in so far as we do not benefit from it. But as long as we benefit from it, it's our uncle, our aunties, our brothers, our sisters, we will not be unhappy with it. We are only unhappy when we see that it is another person benefiting. It is a skewed society. It is a problem of the mind. So, for example, when the ACC is running after every other person, everyone claps. But when your uncle, who is manifestly corrupt, and you yourself know is corrupt, is arrested, you start insulting the ACC on social media, that they are being selective. This is what we have to deal with. And of course, we have the problem of the justice system. A judiciary that is organized in such a way that even though a lot has been done to reform, and of course there's a lot of improvement, but to date, it is very, very likely that an influential person, depending on how influential you are, may escape even when the evidence against you is very strong for corruption. And we are talking about the rule of law. And the greatest protection, the greatest protector of the rule of law is the judiciary. A crucial part of anti-corruption campaign is the necessity for an uncompromising judiciary that will not only interpret and apply anti-corruption laws, but also ensure fair and expedient trial of persons who have been accused of corruption, which is also in sync with adhering to the principles of the rule of law. The judiciary is therefore a key player in the actualization of robust anti-corruption regimes, as well as upholding the rule of law. The judiciary is a serious partner in the fight against corruption, and the energy that comes from the judiciary determines how well we can succeed against corruption because they are the holder of the sharp, of the, the, the sharp edge of justice. They can determine whether people should be given custodial sentence or they should be given fines. Therefore, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we come to the question, it is stated in our Constitution, Section 6, 
Subsection 5. The states shall take all steps necessary to eradicate corrupt practices and the abuse of power. I have often drawn this particular provision to the attention of even lawyers. It seems people don't know that it is in our constitution from as way back as 1991. Section 6, which is among the fundamental principles, says the state shall take all steps to eradicate all corrupt practices and the abuse of power. It is unqualified. And you lawyers know when something is unqualified. Not so? Not so? You law students, when we say something is unqualified, what does it mean? Somebody brave should say, when he says you shall take all steps necessary to solve this problem, what does it mean? It means your hands are not tied. Not so? Not so? Because if the law wanted to tie your hands, Israel said what? Except, notwithstanding, however, not so? There will be There will be, thank you, there will be what we call qualification to the proposition. But let me also read to you what is in the Anti-Corruption Act. Section 7 says, The commission shall take all steps as may be necessary for the prevention, eradication, or suppression of corruption and corrupt practices, and to also investigate any matter that in the opinion of the commission raises suspicion. Is this provision materially different from what is in the Constitution? Do they all not use one phrase, all steps necessary? Not so. So, basically the point we are making is, the laws have always taken the fight against corruption seriously. The problem we have is the implementation of those laws. The problem we have is how we approach this within the framework of the rule of law. Because there is now conflict between those very strong provisions and provisions that say you are what? Innocent until proven guilty. Not so. That is the lawyer's favorite phrase. Not so in the constitution. Not so. You are innocent until proven guilty. So even when the man is found with his hand in the cookie jar and there is cookie in his hands, you want us to take the cookie and the jar to court and the lawyers will look at it and say, let us first determine how the man's hand went into the cookie's jar. Maybe somebody put it in there. He did not put it there himself. Do we understand? So, the cookie jar is there. The man put his hand and took out the cookie. When that cookie belongs to all of us, 8 million people, suddenly, when action is to be taken against him, we spend years in court, objections, demonstrations in the streets against the ACC. The last time, they sent tear gas right into my office at ACC. Because we invited one man to ask him questions about his roles as Minister of Finance and Minister of Foreign Affairs. You all know when we went to McKinney, not so? You saw that tires were burnt in the street, not so? And there were Tamabo men standing there saying, where is that Ben Kaifala? We are going to shave his head today. Not so? Within the framework of the rule of law, the problem is us, the people. The problem is us, the actors. And that includes the judges and even us at the Anti-Corruption Commission. How well and how prepared are we to understand that the framework of the rule of law is a two-way approach? And the individual right is not more important than the collective right. And if you give me the choice to choose, I would prefer the collective right any day over the right of an individual. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
The reality, however, is that the details of the rule of law in our democratic dispensation, especially the presumption of innocence and also the sanctity of constitutionalism and the relativism of justice, are forged with a view to guide not only the political governance processes, but also the enforcement and implementation of law on corruption. And for good reasons, our legal and democratic governance systems have been patterned in this way in order to checkmate the excess of exercise of power and authority and to also preserve uniformity, certainty, coherence, and predictably for our justice system to strive. We all know the phrase, not so? Absolute power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts? Yes. But we forget one thing. And do you know what we forget? Do you know what we forget? The lack of power. Especially where the opponent is corrupt. Has the open hand and can destroy absolutely. Let me rephrase again. We say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely not true. The converse is the lack of power gives up a hand to the corrupt. So if the commission, for example, does not have the right laws, rules, power, authority to do something about corruption because society does not want it, because the political leadership stand in the way of it, because we do not want to push ourselves strong enough to tackle something which is destroying the fabric of our nation for so long, because we just like to be mediocre, because we are lackluster. That is more dangerous than power, because it is called the lack of power. And as a people, we have to understand that intersection. Madam Chair, there is no gain saying the fact that corruption costs all of us absolutely. Why it may be possible for a corrupt system to coexist with the functioning of the rule of law in practice, the worse the corruption, the more likely it is to endanger the rule of law. There is no greater danger to the rule of law than corruption. When there is corruption, let's forget about the rule of law. We are lying to ourselves. When corruption is too prevalent, all that blah, blah, blah about the rule of law is a joke. The anti-corruption campaign we are leading as a nation is not a one-size-fits-all campaign. Rather, it's a campaign and fight that is contextual and must therefore be shaped by our context and the tactics of the corrupt. The demand is really no longer one of applying a collection of more or less technocratic solutions. Rather, it is how we must develop nuanced set of possible remedies that fit our context. There is no doubt that the combination of the rule of law with the elements of equality before the law, the right to fair trial, presumption of innocence, and determination of rights by the courts constructs a paradigm of accountability by the exercise of power and the realization of justice. Let's not say that what I am saying means we should disregard the rule of law. It is important. What I am saying is that we should... You see, let me say this again. The law is what society says should be in it. The law is what society says should be in it. And similarly, justice is what society determines it to be. And that is why in Saudi Arabia there is justice according to their own laws. Not so. 
Not so. In Saudi Arabia, they can try a man within five minutes and shoot him dead. Not so. As far as they are concerned, it is justice. If you do that in the U.S. or in Sierra Leone, what would you say? Abuse, not so. Yes. Two days ago, a lady was killed in, 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 um, in Nigeria, Sokoto, for just posting something on WhatsApp about the Prophet Muhammad. Which other people were unhappy about? They went and dragged her out of her room. She ran to hide. They put her, they cut her head and put fire on her and burned her in, in broad daylight, the same minute. And now in Sokoto, some people say it is justice because Sharia law says it is. And some people say it is not justice because, of course, they are applying the normal law. I am not saying that what is, was done here is right, but all I am trying to tell Sierra Leone is that what is justice is what society says it is. So, when we are tailoring our laws, we have to understand that all these principles that are out there, rule of law, all those things, they are important, human rights, yes, they are important, but we are dealing with a wicked problem. The solution lies with us. And we can determine what goes into our laws. It will become the rule of law. Do we understand? Therefore, it is a question of how willing we are. What lies, what has been etched painfully on the scrolls of our hearts by Sir Milti Magai and others? How are we willing to push ourselves? Madam Chair, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I know this topic, we can have a conversation about it the entire time. But I'm going to wrap up now and leave it to you to ask questions, for us to engage, for us to have views, because it is by conversation now. But before I go, my admonition to all of us when dealing with the rule of law and the fight against corruption is this. We have to break away from the abstract law giving and conduct more research and develop laws that problem solve rather than merely exist. We have to break away from abstract law giving. When we take what A.B. Dice said, what Baron de Montesquieu said, and just come and put it into our laws. We have to conduct research on our own societies and develop rules as well. We have to take a proper look at our domestic institutions and mindset of our people and champion the creation of constitutional guarantees, judicial reviews, greater judicial independence and access to justice, which will naturally lay a better path to domestic, to development of Sierra Leone's rule of law. Sierra Leone's rule of law does not have to be U.S. rule of law. Sierra Leone's rule of law does not have to be U.K. rule of law. I have told you that there is rule of law in Saudi Arabia. There is rule of law in Rwanda. There is rule of law in Nigeria. And there is rule of law in Canada. The mistake we often make is to think that the rule of law is a one can and speak all approach to solving our problem. That's why we are failing. Our laws have to be contextual. It has to be ceremonial. It has to be by the mindset of our people. It has to take into consideration our own wicked problems and find lasting solutions for them. As I conclude, Pratibha Patil, the 12th president of India, once said, Corruption is the enemy of development and of good governance. It must be got rid of. Both the government and the people at large must come together to achieve this national objective. Do not leave the fight against corruption to the government alone. Do not leave the fight against corruption to the ACC alone. Do not leave the fight against corruption to a few. We all have to come together and work if we have to solve the problem. 
It is about what you do in private as much as what you do in public. If we all have that mindset, we can solve Sierra Leone's problem easily. You, the young people of this country, have a huge role to play. In the words of renowned songwriter Kurt Cobbin, the duty of the youth or the young people is to challenge corruption. All of you, your duty is to challenge corruption, not to condone it. I throw the challenge to you today, and we must start by delineating the boundaries that belie both the rule of law and the campaign against corruption while we prioritize that which challenges our collective interest the most. You all have the responsibility to help with crafting the right rules, to help with speaking truth to power, to help with supporting the fight against corruption. And you cannot leave it only to those who are given the responsibility to fight corruption. It is as much your problem as it is the problem of government. Madam Chair, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all for the audience.